Why use vignettes? First of all, it personalizes the course. The students want to get to know you. You don't want to get to know them, God forbid, especially with the 500 kids I have. But they really want to know more about you, OK? Secondly, by doing this, it makes you think more about the course. I find this thing is on my mind an awful lot because I'm looking up stories that I can tell the students to illustrate economic ideas. Thirdly, by doing so, it involves the student. It forces them to think of their own stories to illustrate ideas. And lastly, of course, this sure beats equations, and it's a complement to graphs. So in that sense, it really gets them to think about things that they ought to be thinking about. Anyway, where do you get these ideas from? First of all, movies. There's all kinds of stuff in the movies, as my predecessors showed you with TV shows. Your family. I'm very fortunate. I have six grandchildren. I mean, they range in age from 19 to 9. And they've been producing stories for me almost uh, since they were three or four. Uh, things I do in my life. I travel a lot. I run around a lot. So you get all kinds of different things. And it is the case, by the way, in micro. The best way to see the impact of prices is to go to countries of much different wealth levels or of different relative prices. I was really flipped out that in Europe, the escalators don't run continually. They have electric eyes, and they only go on when you get on the escalator. Why don't we do that here? Well, the answer we all know why is electricity prices are different. The news, like the story with the Pope of Palooza today, interactions with students. And so what I want to do is illustrate some of these. This is why I was thinking about this just two years ago. I don't know how, if you've been teaching a long time, but the kids used to come to your office hours. They don't come to your office hours anymore. They write emails. The typical email is, hi, prof. Okay? That's the start. I heard yesterday of some English professor who won't answer anything unless it says, dear Professor H. And you know, I thought about it, and I thought he's pretty stupid. Because if he doesn't answer it, the kids are going to come to the office hours, right? And you know, they're going to come to the office hours at a time when your time is very valuable and it's very crowded. So I decided that it's just it's not worth worrying about this. Get with the modern times. I'm economizing on my time. And that's especially true, and this illustrates opportunity costs. My time is very valuable when there's a huge demand. When there's a huge demand for your time, what time of the semester is your time in very big demand by the students? The day or two before the midterms, right? We all know that. I told the kids also, I'd like to do peak load pricing on my office hours, OK? <laughs> the first two weeks, I will subsidize your coming to see me. And I'll use the money I make by taxing you the day or the week before the midterm to even it out across the semester. And so I'll cross-subsidize based upon the opportunity cost. They don't appreciate that at all, by the way. <laughs> but I think it's a really good idea. OK, here's a story. I like to smoke good cigars, not very often. And I spent a lot of time in Europe. And the nice thing about spending time in Europe, even still now, is you can get what is unequivocally the best cigar in the world, a Cohiba. This is the same brand that Fidel smokes. And that, therefore, proves it's the best in the world. So the question I wanted to ask myself is, what's going to happen now that we're opening to Cuba? What's going to happen to my cigar smoking? Okay. Well, the price in the US right now, for all intents and purposes, is infinite. I mean, you can get thrown in jail for importing them. Hasn't stopped a lot of people, including me, but uh, it's not a good thing to do. No question, the price of Cohibas is going to go down. But in the related market, as a result of our siphoning off, I bet a large fraction of the Cohiba supply to the US is that the price in Europe is going to go up. And indeed, I expect to be switching my Cohiba smoking, especially to the US, because it's going to be probably cheaper here since transportation costs are lower. I want to do this. The worst book you and I had to read in high school was Catcher in the Rye. And you'd think that after, I mean, I read it in 1959 when I was a junior in high school. And you'd think they would not read it anymore. My sons read it in the late 80s. And God help me, three of my grandchildren, who have now finished high school, have also read the damn book. Okay? I don't know why they keep on assigning it, but it does have, and this is a story a student gave me, about a game problem in the middle of Catcher in the Rye between Holden Caulfield, that's the hero of this book, and his sister Phoebe. 
So I did a payoff by matrix here, and if you can see it, for Phoebe and Holden, where Holden's strategy is to run away and stay, and Phoebe's strategy is to run away or stay. Now, Phoebe is really concerned about being in the school play, but she sort of likes to be with Holden. Holden, it's not clear, does not have a dominant strategy, but Phoebe does. Phoebe's gonna stay home to be in the play no matter what. Given that, even though Holden does not have a dominant strategy, Holden's gonna stay home with her, and indeed, you can then show the stay, stay is a Nash equilibrium, and it's a Pareto optimum. There are other Pareto opta too, obviously. But I mean, all the kids are familiar with this. I mean, you know, it's not like some thing where it's in the popular culture, but you might not have seen it. Everybody has read this book, regrettably. In the first edition of the little book, the draft I had had a story about the optimality of sex tonight or tomorrow night, okay? Pointing out that one partner said, let's do it tonight. The other said, no, let's wait till tomorrow night. You can guess the gender of these, by the way. And uh, I pointed out that these are both Pareto optima, obviously. So my, my, the editor then, who's now retired, said, get this out of the book. It's not going to sell at Baylor, okay? Uh, or lots of other places either, okay? Now this next one here, though, was allowed to be in some edition of the book. If you know the movie American Pie 2, people know the movie? Okay, believe me, you may or may not know it. I guarantee you your students know this movie. Okay, they all know the movie. In the movie is the rule of three. It's just a wonderful scene where, it, first of all, shows the guys, I can't remember which comes first, saying, you know, with women, you gotta use the rule of three. If they say they've had one sex partner, multiply it by three. The next scene is the women talking. You know, with guys, you gotta use the rule of three. If they say they've had three sex partners, divide by three, okay? <laughs> the question is, is that a Nash equilibrium in this dynamic game? And the answer is clearly not because if the women know the guys are gonna multiply by three, they're gonna lower the number, right, to appear more demure. And obversely, if the guys know the women are gonna divide by three, they're gonna raise the number. So I tell the students when I talk about this that there really is no Nash equilibrium. The limit is what I call the Wilt Chamberlain upper bound, if you remember him, okay? Uh, but it's just a really nice example of a fairly subtle point, I think, in economics. Ah, yes, this is wonderful. This is a student story which I developed. I don't know if you remember the movie, the book by Tom Wolfe, I Am Charlotte Simmons. Anybody ever read that? Okay, you really should. It's a superb story, and it's about academics, okay? Anyway, a woman wrote a story from my class saying that she was, as Tom Wolfe calls it, she was sexiled by her roommate, okay? <laughs> Uh, the roommate wanted privacy in the dormitory, and my student was really annoyed to have to go down at three in the morning and sit in the lobby of the dorm. Worse than that, she said, the roommate was creating negative externalities of sound for the whole floor because the walls are really very thin. So the question is a subtle question. There's no Pareto, there's no obvious Pareto optima here. Somebody would ever change you make, somebody will be worse off. But the issue is who has property rights to the room? And there's no good answer to that. The roommate established property rights. I would argue that since I put everybody's utility equal, since only one person, actually two people are better off by having the room, uh, I would argue the roommate should be thrown out and let her go out and, you know, to quote the, uh, to quote the old song, do it in the road rather than in the room. Okay. okay, my favorite story of all times, that's the Harvard, you know, in case that's Ver Van I call it Vanitas. That's Veritas, the Harvard symbol, okay? And I, every year, I hope you do this too, kids can think up immense numbers of examples of externalities. And I always ask kids, what's your example? And think of one coming in the next class. At the start of the next class, this very, very shy woman in the back of the room raised her hand and said, I think I have one for you. I said, okay, go ahead. She said, she has a roommate, and they have beds on each side of the room. So here's the roommate's bed, here's her bed. The roommate has a poster of her boyfriend over the bed, a giant poster. I said, yeah, what's wrong with that? She said, well, I have to look at it and he's really ugly, okay? 
so what the roommate is doing is making herself well off but imposing this negative externality on my student. So I thought for a second, I said, well, you know, if he's so ugly, why does she go out with him? And she had a wonderful four-word answer. He goes to Harvard, okay? <laughs> and he's also a very nice guy, okay? Which the nice thing about this was it got us to talking about the rate of return to schooling and the role of education in spousal matching. Okay? So it was a very nice sort of two things for the price of one story. But again, asking the kids for their own externality stories is really easy. This is the last one, then I'll be done. So there's innumerable comparative advantage stories. Uh, Let's use this one. So my wife and I are going to a wedding reception. I didn't realize it's now seven years ago at this fancy hall. And we get there, and there's lots and lots of people. There's a guest book, and there's the drink line. Okay? So we, we've, been, we've been married already for 42 years. We're now married 49 years. And we say, what should we do? And we knew we've been together so long, we know what to do. I said, Francis, and she said to me, Daniel, you get the drinks. I'd like a glass of white wine. I'm going to go sign in. Now, I was probably a little bit better. I think I had an absolute advantage of getting the wine because I'm bigger and can push my way in. My arms are longer. And there's no question she has an absolute advantage at writing. My handwriting is just illegible. So she raced ahead to the writing desk. I raced ahead to the wine place. And we were the first couple to have done both of them because we understood the idea of comparative advantage. So, you know, this is a very useful subject, economic is. I mean, it really makes you very, very successful at all kinds of life things. The main point of all of this, though, is every one of you could make up stories one or two a day. It's very, very easy to do. And as I say, it personalizes things. I have time for one more. Let me do one more, because I just made this up yesterday. I think it's pretty cool. There's an egg crisis. Did you know that in the United States? It apparently is an egg crisis. I didn't know there was an egg crisis. The price of a dozen eggs is now $2.94. After inflation, in real terms, the highest it's been in 31 years. I didn't know that. It's up 14% in just one month. Why has this happened? Any guesses? Because the supply of chickens has fallen. They've culled about 11% of the chicken supply because of worries about avian flu. Okay. So we've had 11% drop in supply, and we've had a 14% rise in price. Student, figure out the elasticity implicit in that. Very, very simple to do. Next question for the students, okay. Is this the end of the story? Will this egg crisis, if you want to use the word crisis for it, will this egg crisis persist for the next year or two? What's the answer? No, because it's not too hard to produce a laying chicken. Okay, and I'm quite sure that with the higher price, the chicken farmers are going to be producing more chickens, unless, of course, the ag department keeps on killing off millions and millions every week. Okay, so again, here's a whole bunch of things you can build one upon the other. There's something in the news, something in your life every day. Personalizing it really is a good idea. So do it yourself. Don't listen to me. Thank you very much.